Hello and welcome back to Data Science CastNet. My um, Zotero library has gotten to the point again where there's just too many tabs open and a lot of these are papers that I've already skimmed or that I have been meaning to look at that don't really have the impetus to. And so in this video, rather than doing what I usually do, which is just to declare bankruptcy and start again, I thought I'd go through them and say a few words about each, maybe read the ones that I haven't read yet, at least skim uh, just to get a vague idea. So this is not going to be particularly educational, but I thought it might be interesting to some people. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through left to right. I don't even remember what most of these are, or at least why they're in here. Um, but this one I definitely do remember. It's a classic UL2, Unifying Language Learning Paradigms. This is particularly salient at the moment, and the reason it's been open again, even though it's from February last year. Um, Yi Te, after writing this paper, uh, left Google along with some others and started the um, RECA core, I forget, the um, organization name, um, but they yeah they've released their own series of models and um, particularly interesting they're at least some of them encoder decoder models and also mentioned maybe using this UL2 objective. Um, so pretty cool paper um, basically looking at how do we you know is auto regressive training always the best? What about these older encoder decoder models? What are some of these ones that have like span corruption or different types of training objectives? Can we unify that all into one framework? Um, and so. Yeah, their idea is to, they call this mixture of denoises, but it's just, um, it's not like a mixture of experts style thing. It's more like a mixture of objectives. And so this is the key figure here. These are the different ways they train. So sometimes you have just small individual chunks of a long input masked out. And so you'll see, um, here's my, my input, da, 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 mask, mask, token, 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 mask, token, 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 token. And then your goal is to just fill in these uh, individual little short spans. Um, you also have ones with a larger span. So this is, I forget that what these um, these letters stand for. Um, but again, I'm going to generate here and then I'm going to have to continue generating this. This is more like, um, I guess, closer to something like the autoregressive modeling. Um, a mix, right? Shorter spans within. Um, and they can shift these up so you have like all these parameters to control. What are the, the lengths of the spans that are masked out relative to the total? What's the mix of tasks within each? Um, and yeah, how exactly do you like juggle that during training to get the best effect? Um, so pretty cool paper. Um, also fun. Uh, let's see, they have a 20B model, scaling up to 20B parameters. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Basically, if I remember the story rightly, they just forgot that this was training. So the reason this has been trained um, for a lot longer and why it was like state of the art at the time is partly because they just left this on um, and yeah, we were not attentively monitoring the job. They just kind of forgot this was training for about a month, I, I believe. So a uh, pretty funny bit of history there. Anyway, cool paper, cool objective to say, why are we only predicting the next word? We can do these other types of tasks and that might help on downstream performance. Um, yeah, so pretty cool, worth revisiting. Uh, all right, next one. Preference fine tuning of LLMs should leverage suboptimal on policy data. This is one of a number of papers that are basically saying the same sorts of things. I think there might be one more recent in here, also from Google. Yeah, it's like we have these these two warring factions, right? We have like the more traditional RL inspired, you know, PPO, etc. Um, and then we have these. Oh, we can use DPO. Um, approaches right we have uh, preference pairs or something like that and we can we can train on that um, and one of the key differences to me is less like the particular algorithm and more like what generated the data that you're using and where did you get those scores um, and specifically like the idea between oh um, I'll just use random pairs of data generated by two different models some time ago and ranked versus like oh I'll use different completions generated by the same model that I'm currently busy training either in this like iterative approach like some recent papers where at least, you know, I generate some data, I rank that data or score it somehow, I train on, on that scored pairs, and then I generate some new data, repeat in this in these like big iterations, or even better, like continuously doing that. Um, yeah, so I'm not gonna go too much into these, but basically yeah, I've just been looking at some papers that have been poking at this. Why why does PPO traditionally do better than DPO? And is it because of the algorithms themselves, or is it because of like one is is more is closer to like on policy or at least using that same policy that we're updating to generate the uh, the data. Uh, anyway, not going to go into that. Let's see what else we got. Okay, same task, more tokens, impact of input length on reasoning performance of large language models. 
um, this and a few others um, basically came up because we were frustrated with the uh, needle in a haystack being the the gold standard of long context evaluation is like that's not actually a hard task um, can we find different types of tasks that have multiple pieces of relevant information that need to be retrieved um, and then use those to answer um, so this is a pretty cool paper that tries to do that and very interesting to see that you know these are all models that have advertised tens or hundreds of thousands of tokens of context length um, but in, in this particular task that requires fetching multiple different things and then reasoning about them um, some models do a lot better than others um, and yeah but none of them have this perfect 100% accuracy out to a million tokens like the needle and the haystack tasks so pretty cool to see people starting to find harder evals for long context um, similarly Excel bench um, another benchmark for long context understanding um, let's see so they have um, yeah, make connective inferences across input documents to fulfill the goal. Um, pretty cool to see people starting to think, how do we evaluate these better than just, oh, does it know what the best thing to do in San Francisco is? Uh, eating a pizza in some sort of park <laughs> is the standard needle on the haystack test. Um, okay, this was a lovely paper. I really enjoyed this. Retrieval head mechanistically explains long context factuality. Um, also on that topic of retrieval. Um, basically, they find that there's certain um, heads, they call them retrieval heads, in the model that appear in lots of these different models that all have the same sort of mechanism only a small portion of the heads do this um, they they already exist even in models pre-trained with short context and these um, attention heads basically are activated when you're verbatim like producing some string that was originally deeper in the model um, so they have a way of finding this which is to say um, yeah does it does it attend to the same token that's being generated so if I'm generating this span here that was hidden somewhere in this long context and now I'm going to generate it again, um, if I find a head that's heavily activating and attending to the same token that I'm currently generating, that's what they use as this metric for like, oh, this is a retrieval head. Um, and specifically, like this is not just uh, a correlation that they find. If you then mask out these heads, it does way worse at these retrieval tasks um, versus if you just mask out 5% of random heads, uh, the performance doesn't drop at all. So this definitely just does seem to be causal. Um, yeah, really nice paper. It's fun to think about like, oh, cool, cool to identify a mechanic that explains some of this performance. Um, and also explains things like um, there's this big brouhaha of like, oh, the needle in the haystack, you know, the anthropic models couldn't do this at all. And then they said, hey, we just changed the prompt slightly to say, you know, first quote the relevant context and then give us the answer. Um, and then suddenly the accuracy was at 100%. Um, and that makes sense to me, given this like mechanistic interpretation is like, oh, well, verbatim copying a sentence is maybe a lot easier than just producing an answer directly that maybe doesn't include this verbatim quoting. Um, and the reason is that by verbatim quoting, it can leverage these heads that are already designed to do that, um, pull out that data. And then once that's now in the like recent context and, uh, you know, it's like more obviously the answer that can then produce the final, this is the best thing to do in whatever um okay so i'm not gonna waste too much more time on that but good paper on it's like one of the most useful in interpretability quote-unquote papers i've seen okay laura plus efficient low rank adaption of large models um there's a whole zoo of different ones i can't remember why we were looking at this particular one um right uh yeah i guess key takeaway here is that um well i mean okay i remember now why some of these are open um there was this more recent paper Laura learns less and forgets less um, from the guys at Mosaic now Databricks um, with some collaborators. Uh, cool paper. They look at um, instruction tuning and continued pre-training and they say, oh, Laura substantially underperforms full fine tuning, but it does have this good regularization. It keeps the base model's performance on tasks outside of the target domain. Um, and so I've been uh, with, with teammates investigating um, different variants of Laura, And there's a lot of like, since the original LoRa like idea caught on, there's been a lot of improvements. Um, some of them, it's hard to tell whether they're genuine improvements. Some of them actually pretty useful. Um, and specifically things like DoRa, um, uh, different ways of initializing RS LoRa for quantization, uh, you know, FA LoRa and whatever. Lots of different like tweaks to make it a lot better. So we were kind of wondering, oh, was that paper finding like deficiencies in just the vanilla LoRa? And what would happen if you took in all of these these learnings? You should see. Um, Daniel from the Unsloth has a fantastic tweet looking at a lot of ways that you can make Lura better. Anyway, this is one of them um, using different learning rate for the B, B um, versus A projection um, 
networks in in LoRa um, gets a gets an improved um, performance. There's also uh, okay, it's just a good survey paper. I'm gonna look at that. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, different lower variants. Um, hopefully, yeah. I'm guessing. Hopefully, over time, we'll converge onto like tried and trusted recipes that aren't just like oh, the original lower paper. Like, nope, we we know better now. Train all the different projections, not just the uh, attention heads or whatever. Use these different learning rates. Use these approaches. Use something like Dora versus plain Lora. Initialize it correctly, etc., etc., etc. Um, okay, another one. Insights into alignment, evaluating DPO and its variants across multiple tasks. This is back on the, um, is DPO as good as the others? What about the different variants? Uh, which one's best? Um, yeah, it's good to see people like digging in and trying to understand which of these is better. I feel like we're slowly like figuring out some of the space here. Um, it still seems like we're waiting for it all to like shake down into like what's actually the best approach and everything. But generally like, oh, having something that... Um, is closer to on policy, like using the actual model to generate completions, that's good. Better feedback slash ranking, that's good. Um, yeah, maybe like tweaked objective, unlike the original DPO, so that you can have like some label noise and be robust to that, probably good. Um, yeah, whether it at all, like we just figure out how to do PPO and abandon all of these other ones, or whether we like get really good at some variant remains to be seen. Uh, okay, Google DeepMind, best practices and lesson learned on synthetic data for language models. Um, I haven't actually read this one yet, so maybe I'll leave this one open. Uh, okay, Imogen is the main figure, great. <laughs> yeah, I'll look at that later maybe. Um, physics of language models part 3.3, this came up um, as an interesting... <sighs> yeah, deep dive, it's a, a couple of authors at FAIR. Um, kind of easy to miss except that I know they used like ridiculous amounts of compute and did a huge amount of ablations to dig into various like yeah you know, what does the model actually learn how much does it compress knowledge etc um, and so they have this claim that language models can and only can store two bits of knowledge per parameter even on quantized state bits um, so yeah it's a pretty interesting claim I haven't looked in too deeply um, as to like how exactly they get there um, lots of other little results. Um, yeah, so definitely worth reading more. Actually, I'm also going to leave this one open. Um, it's been a while since I even looked at it. Um, but let's keep that in mind. There was, I think, some other papers also related to that. Um, better and faster language models via multi-token prediction. This is great. If you've seen my video on speculative decoding um, and Medusa and so on, um, this is kind of a recent modern extension of that. Um, not just predicting the next token, but you might as well predict some number of tokens in advance. Um, kind of a disheartening paper in the sense that a um, small scale tests, you would kind of conclude that this was maybe like not worth it and actually like harming your predictions. It's only when you get to like the billion parameter scale and above that you start to see this improvement and the improvement grows with model scale. Um, so yeah, a lot of people taking this as kind of a, um, a bit of a bummer for like small scale research where, oh, if I have to do my experiments, like training these giant models that are you know 7 billion parameters or 13 billion parameters that's that's tricky for <laughs> someone who doesn't have the um, the resources of a big company um, but cool to see speculative decoding slash whatever um, definitely a nice way to speed up your sampling because you can predict the next eight tokens or whatever with your models and even if the predictions out in the future aren't particularly accurate you can check them with one forward pass through just looking at the immediate next token prediction to like validate that. So it's very much like the speculative decoding. Uh, okay, moving on. Prioritize training on points that are learnable, worth learning and not learned yet. This is an older paper, can't remember why it came up again, um, but something to do with like choosing, um, how do I choose which data points to train on? Um, yeah, so I can't remember who why we were looking at this or what we pulled from it, but interesting enough old paper. <laughs> Not that old, 2022, but still. Um, oh, that's right, because it's also called row. <laughs> um, so we have a more recent row paper that's also about like what tokens do you need. Um, and I don't think it even cites the other one. So that's that's why it was open, I guess. Um, okay, so this is um, Microsoft paper. Not all tokens in a corpse are equally important for language model training. Um, Delves, nice. Um,
selective language modeling that selectively trains on useful tokens that are aligned with a desired distribution. So we score pre-training tokens using reference model and then train with the focus on tokens with higher excess loss. Um, okay, so some sort of filtering approach that gives them um, faster training per token, basically. Um, interesting. I don't think we actually even got to this paper. Maybe we like just started looking at it. It's not ringing many bells. So this is cool. Um, it's like, why? how do we make this decision that this is a, a desired token or undesired token? That's the bit that I'd be curious about. So we have a reference model on high quality data. We score each token's loss in the corpus using the reference model, and then we train the language model on the ones that show high excess loss compared to the reference loss. So it's like, okay, so this model here, this reference model is trained on like fantastic data, but maybe not that much. Um, so now I've got a bunch of pre-training data that includes some garbage and some good stuff. I train a language model, and if the loss on a given token for this model that I'm training is worse than the loss from my high quality data model, then maybe that's a sign that, oh, I should try and learn this token better, right? And so I guess on the garbage, your high quality data model is not gonna have a very high loss. It's because it's learned on good quality data. So it's gonna do badly on that. So it's not gonna be hard for our model to beat the reference model on this slop. But on the good stuff, um, the high quality model is going to be trained on this good stuff and so beating it it's going to require more work and so that's where we might have this uh, excess loss initially and we want to like improve so that we can match the high quality model on the high quality stuff so okay that's an interesting idea cool that it sort of works um, I'm not sure how the uh, economics of having to train the reference model first etc play into things but um, yeah cool experiment I am going to close it for now but if it comes up again I will look in more detail <laughs> okay, um, transformers can achieve length generalization, but not robustly. It's pretty cool, I guess. Can we um, extend and generalize to longer tasks, in particular, in this case, addition? Um, previously, people have tried to extend this and found that it's hit and miss. So they say, oh, position encoding is key. Um, there we go. We can finally like extrapolate longer than the input length. Uh, seems interesting. I have not perused this yet. I confess I probably won't. This is a clear out session. Um, self play preference optimization for language model alignment. Um, yet another like, oh cool, can we um, do something DPO-ish? Um, lots of cool words, Nash equilibrium. Okay, so what's the idea here again? see if they've got a nice diagram. So I remember reading this paper, but I don't remember much, or at least not enough to like explain it. Um, da -da -da, lots of math, lots of math, lots of math. I have a feeling this simplified something. Okay, yeah, here we go. I've got a base policy. So this is like my pre-trained model. Preference oracle, uh, in this case, maybe some sort of scoring function or LLM as a judge or something like that. Um, we're going to go through a number of steps. We're going to generate synthetic responses um, using the policy that we're optimi we're training. Um, annotate the win rate. So if I've done two different completions, like which one wins um, using this uh, preference oracle or whatever scoring thing is, I assume. Um, grab responses from this. So we've got a whole collection of completions for this given question, right? This could be a question or instruction. This is like multiple attempts to complete it. Um, I annotate the win rate and I get some pairs here or um, sections of here where I have now a, like here's a winning one and a losing one. Um, and so now I can do something that looks pretty DPO-ish where I'm saying I would like the, um, the probability 
ratio between my policy and the base policy um, to let me try and read this right. I would like to make the um, the better of these completions more likely. Um, what is this little P with a hat? Oh, this is my frustration with these papers. Is like there's got to be a way to express this pretty nicely in English and in a, an, or in a diagram or something like that. Um, and instead you have to like I'd have to spend a lot more than I have time for in this video to like sit and puzzle out um, all the equations and things but it seems like this is again you know what I was talking about of on policy versus off policy and and um, yeah like all these DPO-ish variants like okay cool if we do this we can um, we generate a bunch of samples we pick the pick the good ones and the bad ones and we train on that somehow um, and that gives us a boost right rather than using um, some existing set of completions and preferences. Then I use my new model that's been updated and I do that again. Generate a new set of responses, create my new data set of like winning and losing pairs or whatever, um, or just the good ones maybe, um, train on those, use a reward model, score them, do that again, you know, and each of these like iterations is getting some improvement. Um, and so we're able to get a, a higher and higher alpaca eval win rate. Um, yeah, so pretty cool. Uh, I think there's been a whole slew of papers like this. I I can't ever keep them straight, um, but nice to see that people are experimenting with this idea of like, oh, okay, this is you can see this is closer to like an ideal of okay, I'm generating things with a policy and then I'm scoring them somehow and then I'm updating to make the good ones more likely and the bad ones less likely, like in some way. And the the details of that always changes, but something like that. Um, and then I'm not just like keeping with that stale data. I'm like generating a new batch now that I've updated my policy, repeating, repeating, um, and this kind of like iterative approach seems pretty good. Um, and I know different ones use the model itself as a reward model as well, or they have a separate reward model, or they have like some other scoring function, or they get humans to rate things. It's all like a whole jumble of different approaches, but the same core idea. Um, okay, let's see if there's any others in that zone here that I can, yeah, iterative preference, iterative reasoning preference optimization feels like another one of the same. Get some training prompts, got a model, I generate some, uh, in this case, chains of thoughts and answers, I compute the rewards, and then I get my preference pairs, and I do DPO. Um, with I think this paper was cool because they said, oh, you should also like do a normal, this is the uh, negative log likelihood, i.e. like the normal language modeling objective, as well as the DPO objective. Um, and then rinse and repeat, do this iteratively as well. Um, okay, so... Maybe it's getting the previous one and this one confused, but all like, again, lots and lots along this similar idea. Uh, we're generating everything with the model that we want to be training. Um, in this case, they have rewards for the answers and then they're hoping that this results in generating better chains of thought. Um, and I think they had some interesting examples of like being able to like correctly assign um, the reward to the previous things. Um, also cool looking at like traditional DPO-ish approaches, you get like, the um the likelihood of the chosen response and the likelihood of the rejected response go up right there's there's like some there's all sorts of weird effects of like oh you know we might actually not be um separating those two as much as we want whereas here like oh we, we're able to like do exactly what we want out of this kind of training which is to make the good responses more likely and the bad responses less likely without like completely destroying the base language ability so i think of a lot of the ones that we've looked at, this is maybe a good paper to pull out from all of the IPO, PPO, DPO, IRPO, SPPO, gazillion variants. Um, this looked like a good one, if I remember right. <laughs> um, okay. Careful examination of large language model performance on grade school arithmetic. Um, right, okay, so this paper is just a new benchmark, GSM1K which is designed to be very similar to the GSM 8K benchmark, but um, yeah, importantly, um, not public. And so if a model is overfit to the original public GSM 8K benchmark, um, it might do worse on this new data set versus the original. Whereas if a model is like genuinely robustly good, it should do about the same on both. So the headline of this paper and the way a lot of people interpret it is like, oh, we evaluate, you know, these models and we see accuracy drops in several families. Oh, fires overfit the benchmarks. Oh, misrule's cheating. 
I'll, I'll show you some figures quickly, like why I don't quite believe that. Um, okay, so here's the, the key figure that everyone shared. Um, a lot of models do about the same on the um, GSM 8K versus GSM 1K, but a few notable ones do a fair bit worse on the GSM 1K, this new secret uh, data set. So oh, these ones must be cheating. Oh, it's a big, big scandal. Um, okay, but let's go through some of the actual um, the actual results. Right, so here's here's one plot. Okay, we've got accuracy on one versus accuracy on the other. And so you'd say, okay, maybe something that does significantly better on GSM 8K might have some sort of contamination. Um, and so it's interesting to see like the Mistral medium, like the API version, bang on the line, but um, the 8X7B that was maybe trained on, you know, a, a larger mix of like more public data sets that include maybe some contamination is a little bit of an outlier. Um, but also, like, if you squint, this is not actually, like, a crazy spread. Like, I'd expect some rough correlation like this. I wouldn't expect it to be perfect. It's different, different sets of questions, different prompting styles, etc. Um, here's another one, again, like, oh, you know, does this tell you all of these models ever fit? Or is it just that, like, there's a general trend here. Like, models that tend to do better on one also tend to do better on the other. You know, like, it's kind of hard to cheat on this math ability too much. Um, besides, like, actually having the test set in your training data. So maybe some of these have some contamination, but to me this is just like, oh, this is a clear trend. Like, there's a few outliers that we could, like, look at and maybe be a little bit suspicious of, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, and it's also, like, it's highly impressive that, like, Phi 1, you know, this is a model that's really tiny. Um, it's doing well on this new hidden test set, so, like, it's actually good at math. It's, like, surprising in some ways. Uh, I think some people were expecting things like, oh, it'll be do really, really well on GSM 8K but it would do completely nothing on this new hidden data set of completely novel questions. Um, and that's not actually what we see. Um, yeah, so I thought that was interesting. Also, um, in the appendix somewhere, they have um, with different like prompt variants and things, um, the differences go away even further. So let's see. Yeah, so this is an alternate um, prompt approach. Um, and so we have now the GSM 8K versus 1K. Uh, so let's look at some of those like supposedly contentious ones, you know, 75 versus 81, um, yeah, 32 versus 27. Like, so there is some difference, but like it's not huge. Um, and yeah, it's like a lot of these models end up pretty similar, um, you know, a few percent difference here, five percent difference there. Um, but again, like the trend for me here, like the takeaway from me, for me from this paper is like, there's some variance, but in general, models that claim to do well on GSM 8K actually do well on this new held out test set that looks just like um, GSM 8K, right? So, yeah, cool. There's like a few percent difference, sure. But <laughs> yeah, I, I was much more positive of, of this paper and about even the models that were like claimed to show overfitting here, like the Mistral and the Phi. Um, having actually read the paper, it's like, oh, I mean, you know, maybe there's some nuance to exactly the prompting style that's in GSM 8K because some public data sets kind of mirror that. Um, but yeah, they all tend to still be able to do those kinds of questions even on this new hidden um, thousand question new subset. Anyway, too much rambling, uh, moving on. Uh, faith and Fates keeps coming up again, um, mostly because in my circle, we like to go like this and say, um, Let's find the exact phrase here. Um, linearized subgraph matching. <laughs> That's a convenient shorthand for the kind of fuzzy, weird graph matching sp special interpolation fuzzy search thing that transformers can do. One of the things they can do. Um, and that particular bit of shorthand comes from this paper. Um, they're trying to tackle this idea of like what types of tasks can and can't transformers do. What are like the limits of these models? Um, can we find some toy tasks that highlight that and quantify in um, very like careful, well formulated ways, like the difficulty of a task and what it means to have like more and more difficult tasks and what it means to be able to find similar examples in your training set versus the test set? Um, yeah, so lots of things like this where we have um, as this parallelism measure goes up, our performance goes down. Um, if we've only trained up to three digits, you know, we're going to struggle on extensions of that to more digits. Um, likewise for various different, like, logic puzzles and things. Um, adding scratch pads doesn't help. 
you know, so yeah, so this is like, this is the key idea in a lot of these papers. Oh, you, we can do the best that we can, but as soon as we get out of like the in-domain data, as soon as we try and generalize to truly new data, like different types of tasks where you can't just find similar subgraphs or previous solutions or whatever in the training data, um, the performance tends to drop off. Um, yeah, so lots of exploration of that. Um, it's like debatable how much you can read into this paper versus like to extend it to arbitrary things, but I find it's very helpful in terms of giving us like um yeah some ways to think about difficulty of tasks and what it means for two sets of inputs to be similar and um yeah like a lot of good intuition of like oh we have decent accuracy until we get to like some threshold above you know these are the kinds of things that we haven't seen during training um and it's been interesting to discuss this with um, people like at OpenAI and elsewhere who are betting big on these models being able to do effectively everything um, and seeing the different philosophies of like some people saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter that they can only really generalize in domain for a very weird, you know, nuanced meaning of what that is, because it turns out that practically everything is in domain if you train on enough data um, versus people who say, oh, there's genuine limits to what these things can do. And they'll hit a plateau and there'll be some things that they just can't do uh, in the current formulation. Um, OK, AlphaFold 3, we don't need to go into, but cool paper. Late interaction, multimodal retrieval. I was doing some experiments with um, something like Colbert, but for images. And someone pointed me to this paper, which had the same idea. Um, pretty cool. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, so we're going to grab different regions of interest. We're going to encode them. And then we're going to do the same. This maxim is like, oh, you know, here's my my text um, embeddings or whatever you want to call them. Like these might be different tokens in the t in the text query. I'm going to do the maximum similarity across the different like candidates. Um, and so usually do you just do this with the text of the query versus the text of like a potential candidate document. Here they find a way to add a vision model into the equation and be able to do the same kind of late interaction stuff on that. Uh, pretty cool. All right, how good are low bit quantized Llama 3 models? This is a question that's been floating around. Um, we've been able to quantize previous large models pretty easily and pretty aggressively. Um, is this just because they're under-trained? And now that we have something that has been trained over a larger corpus of data, um, can we still get the same free lunch from quantization? Um, so they evaluate quantization and lower fine tuning methods on Llama 3 on different numbers of bits. And they say that it's um, it still has non-negligent, I think non-negligible maybe is the <laughs> correct term there, non-negligent de degradation in these scenarios, especially in low bit width. Um, yeah, so this is an issue of like, oh, we have this model, it's really good. Um, but yeah, as we quantize it, we lose performance, um, basically. So pretty cool to see experiments diving into that. I think, you know, it still remains to be seen, yeah, how this goes as we go forward, what happens as we train these models more and more towards like saturation. Um, does this affect whether we can train, you know, and then quantize later? What about quantization aware training? Um, lots and lots of open questions there still. Uh, okay, we're nearly done. Chameleon, mixed model, early fusion foundation models. This is um, pretty cool. Like, I guess, especially with uh, GPT-4.0 coming onto the scene. This is work from FAIR, Facebook. And um, Interestingly, I think they also said, oh, we finished training Comedian like five months ago and we've kept improving since then. So this is like a, a preview of things to come perhaps. Um, but yeah, pretty cool to have models that can take in image and text and produce images and text. Um, yeah, I have not read the paper much yet, but I'm looking forward to digging in. Seems like they've done some good work. And in the same theme of like new releases, Gemini 1.5, um, diving into like that whole model family, I think they have uh, lots of information on some things, uh, much less information on others. So I was just kind of had it open and was skimming it and I'll probably leave it open and dig into it a little bit more. But um, we're down to four tabs. There's no longer that little like click to show more button. So I think the uh, I think the point of this exercise is done. I'm gonna try and clear these and um, get to a truly clean slate and it'll last probably about 10 minutes with the current pace of research. 
um, yeah, let me know if you found this video at all interesting. I um, That's about as easy as just doing this myself without recording. So um, yeah, if you f find that useful, I'm happy to do this anytime I get to that um, saturated uh, Zotero state, which is usually about once a week these days. Um, so <laughs> yeah, um, let me know if you'd like to see more of this. Otherwise, it's a short little experiment and we should have some other content for you soonish. Thank you so much for watching.